Hi, I'm James Bruns. I'm a physician at Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. My specialty is interventional pain medicine. I did my residency training in anesthesia at University of Nebraska Medical Center. I did my fellowship training at the University of Iowa, hospitals and clinics in Iowa City. Today's topic is DRG stimulation. This is a therapy that I've been utilizing for approximately five years with great success, and I'm here today to share some of my experiences with you. All right, so today's talk is going to be divided into four main sections, as outlined here. We're first gonna talk about the anatomy of the DRG and some of the pathophysiology related to the DRG. Secondly, we're going to discuss why the DRG is such a good target for neuromodulation therapy. Thirdly, we're going to evaluate some of the initial clinical evidence that helps support this therapy. And then finally, we're gonna look at some of the clinical applications of DRG therapy. So just as a little background, you probably already know that chronic neuropathic pain is widespread. In some studies, nearly 12% of general practice patients suffer from inadequately controlled neuropathic pain. And unfortunately, medical management of neuropathic pain is often inadequate and can cause undue side effects from the antineuropathic medications that are used. And as a result, we see chronic pain leading to significant um, increases in morbidity, loss of quality of life and work days, resulting in substantial financial burden. So next, let's turn to a brief discussion on the anatomy of the DRG. The DRG is located on either side of the spinal cord and spans the entire column. Um, although it's only the size of a pea, the DRG contains up to 15,000 neurons. And these are the primary sensory neurons that are responsible for transduction and modulation of incoming um, signals from the periphery, including pain perception. The DRG contains multiple types and sizes of pain fibers, but most notably, I wanted to mention the C fibers, which are involved in an aberrant pain signaling process within the, the cell bodies of the DRG. So next, let's talk about the pathophysiology of DRG and how this relates to uh, eventual neuromodulation therapy. The first thing to understand is that the DRG itself is implicated in the development and maintenance of neuropathic pain. It does so by perpetuating or influencing three different uh, mechanisms important in this process. Firstly, when a peripheral nerve injury occurs, there's an inflammatory response that is activated not only in the periphery, but also centrally in the DRG. And we see that immune cells start to populate the DRG. And as a result of this, there is a attenuation of the inflammatory response at the DRG itself. And this can even be sustained beyond the inflammatory response in the periphery, where the original injury may have taken place. Secondly, it's been demonstrated that when there is peripheral nerve injury, there can be release of neurotrophic factors within the supporting glial cells of the DRG that trigger a growth response in the DRG level corresponding to the peripheral nerve injury. And this can actually lead to compression of the, the sensory neuron cell bodies within the DRG by over proliferation of the glial cells. This can also help perpetuate the inflammatory response at the level of the DRG. Thirdly, it should be noted that peripheral sensory neurons are dependent on, are highly dependent on voltage-gated calcium channels for propagation of action potentials. And in chronic pain, these neurons become hyper-excitable to the presence of calcium. And this has been shown to lead to constant stimulation or overstimulation of the DRG sensory neurons. Furthermore, it has been shown that application of exogenous stimulation to the DRG interrupts pain signaling, and it's thought to be at least in part facilitated through its effect on these voltage-dependent calcium channels. So now let's talk about why we would want to target the DRG. What makes it a good target for neuromodulation? Well, as we just discussed, the DRG plays a very key and critical neurophysiological role in the propagation and proliferation of chronic pain. In addition, the DRG is very predictable in its anatomical location. In the lumbar levels, it's very predictably positioned below the pedicle. 
And in the sacral region, it is in a very predictable and, and easily accessible position within the sacral neural foramen. In addition, there is very limited cerebral spinal fluid around the DRG. This allows for the stimulating leads to be in closer proximity to their neurological target. The result of this is considerably decreased energy needs compared to that of traditional dorsal column stimulation. In addition, it has been shown that with DRG stimulation, there is significantly reduced postural changes in stimulation intensity when compared to that of, of dorsal column stimulation. So because of its proximity to the neural targets and the decreased cerebral spinal fluid, you get much lower energy requirements. In addition, the, the DRG itself as well as the lead are stabilized by adjacent bone and ligamentous structures. This has been shown to result in significantly reduced postural changes in the lead with movement. The same anatomical features may also be protective against lead migration. In a three-year study of 62 patients, only one reported lead migration occurred. Another reason why the DRG is such a good target for neuromodulation is it actually establishes somatotopy before reaching the level of the spinal cord. As a result, there's no spinal cord recruitment necessary for effective therapy. The DRG is also very well mapped and organized to its corresponding peripheral anatomy, and you can actually achieve subdermatomal specificity um, due to this arrangement. This allows for very highly focused treatment. So now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about placement of the DRG leads. So this was first described by Verlis and was published subsequently in 2018. It basically involves an interlaminar loss of resistance technique with a contralateral approach from the targeted site. Generally, there's a 14-gauge TUI needle that's advanced from the contralateral side. Once loss of resistance is achieved, a small curved sheath containing the lead is advanced toward the inferior aspect of the pedicle in question, and the flexible lead is then advanced through the neural foramen with the electrodes ideally positioned adjacent to the DRG. Once lead placement is accomplished, generally S-shaped strain relief loops are created to act as an anchor within the epidural space. The sacral epidural space is accessed directly through the posterior transforaminal approach, and then under lateral visualization, relief loops can then be created as well. So what are some of the techni technical considerations um, regarding DRG stimulation. Well, I like to think of them in three categories. One is operator complications, another is hardware complications, and the third is patient complications. So let's look first at operator complications. One of the biggest things with DRG lead placement is that it's uh, technically challenging and there is a definite learning curve that requires a specific skill set. Beyond that, you generally have some of the same normal operator errors that you would potentially have with dorsal column lead placement, and that is dural puncture. But also, um, you can see new or worsening radicular symptoms with DRG lead placement, given the fact that you're placing the leads within the neural foramen. Hardware complications really fall into the same general categories as those seen with uh, dorsal column lead placement, and that is lead migration or fracture, uh, infection, and persistent or transient CSF leaks. Patient complications include things that are similar to those seen with dorsal column lead placement. One is placebo effect. This occurs when a patient has a perceived response to a trial of neuromodulation and then has a less than optimal response after permanent implant. In addition, you can have just poor patient selection leading to poor outcomes. Some of the anatomical considerations that are unique to DRG, how and where the lead is placed, and these usually center around previous lumbar surgery or pre-existing significant foraminal disease, which oftentimes will preclude DRG lead placement. Let's switch gears again and look at clinical evidence. The accurate study was the initial study that was done that led to DRG approval, FDA approval in this country. It was a large prospective randomized multicenter trial involving 152 patients diagnosed with either CRPS1 or 2 of the lower extremity. 
And these patients received either DRG or traditional dorsal column stimulation therapy. They were reassessed at 3 and 12 months. First thing noted was that there were no significant differences in adverse events between groups, and neither group had any serious device-related events. The percentage of patients, however, receiving greater than 50% improvement was greater in the DRG arm than that of the dorsal column arm at three months. Dorsal column stimulation also demonstrated greater improvements in scores involving quality of life and psychological disposition. Another observation that was noted was that subjects in the DRG arm reported far less postural variation in stimulation compared to those receiving traditional SCS stimulation, indicating that DRG stimulation provided a much more targeted therapy to only the painful parts of the lower extremities. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the clinical applications of DRG. So DRG stimulation is FDA approved for treatment of CRPS1 and CRPS2 of the lower extremities, which essentially means it's approved in the U.S. from T10 down. Now you might think that if DRG therapy is only approved for treatment of CRPS, that it may have limited application in the United States. However, if you look at the table to the right, you can see that the estimated incidence of post-surgical causalgia is not insignificant. If you look at those numbers and then multiply those by average surgical volumes in the United States, you can get numbers that exceed 800,000 cases of post-surgical causalgia or CRPS2. And that's compared to roughly eight to 9,000 cases a year of the traditional CRPS type 1 cases that we deal with. So really, there is a huge population of patients out there that could potentially be candidates for DRG therapy. And these may not even be patients we typically even think of as candidates for any type of neuromodulation therapy. And again, DRG stimulation provides very targeted therapy, which is really one of its greatest strengths. And as indicated in the table, I've listed some of the the spinal levels that one would target for these specific conditions. Lower extremity neuropathy is still considered off-label in the United States. Cervical placement or thoracic placement above T10 is not approved in the United States. So to summarize, the dorsal root ganglion is an ideal target for neuromodulation therapy. It is so because it plays an important role in chronic neuropathic pain. It has very predictable and accessible locations within the neural foramen. Because of the limited CSF within the neural foramen, it allows for stimulation leads to be placed closer to their anatomical targets. And because the DRG contains sensory neurons, there is a separation of sensory and motor fibers preventing unintentional motor stimulation. Thank you for listening to my talk. I hope you found it educational. If you have any other questions regarding DRG stimulation or appropriate candidates for this therapy, please don't hesitate to contact me at Orthopedic Institute in Sioux Falls, South Dakota.